Hello and welcome to the Voice of Intuition podcast. My name is Susan Jane and I believe that trusting your intuition is the best way to live your life with meaning and purpose. Each week you will hear about how you can connect, develop and trust your intuition through the wonderful array of guests we have on the show and my own personal experiences. Join me to understand how your intuition can guide you towards a life full of meaning and loving purpose. Hello and welcome to the Voice of Intuition podcast. My name is Susan Jay and I'm your host for the podcast. And today we have a very, very special guest on. Now, I have had a little bit of a stalking episode with Danielle because I was so intrigued with her story. It's amazing. She has got this amazing backstory and it's not one I would I would recommend to anybody, but she has taken this dramatic, negative, what we see as negative situation and has flipped her life completely around. And at a ripe old age of 23, I can't believe that she is so in tune at such a young age to know what or how to follow her intuition. You've just got to listen to this one. This one's going to be amazing. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so subscribe, share, like, do what you need to for the podcast um, or just listen. I don't really care. Um, but you're going to get so much out of this one. This is going to be terrific. So with no further ado, let's welcome Danielle to the show. Hi, Danielle. Hey, Susan. Thanks for having me on. Ah, we, look, I'm really looking forward to this. Like I said, I did a little bit of stalking um, nicely. Uh, <laughs> checked out your website, did all the, the things that you're supposed to do when you're researching. I just, your story, your backstory is just amazing. Um, if, if I went, I mean, I've gone through stuff as a younger person. I wasn't aware of, of any of the things that we have nowadays and mainly because in those days we didn't have internet, you know. I'm, in fact, I'm that old. I don't even know if we had electricity in those days. But it's <laughs> it, that's what it felt like. Um, it's amazing how you, you've been able to do this. But I, I'm not going to go into I want you to tell, it, to the, tell the world, tell my listeners all about it. But the first thing I want to do is, um, well, actually, usually I ask my guests, how do they get from here to there or like from there to here? But that's your whole story. Yeah. So let's just start. Let's just start with your story. Tell us all about it. I'd be happy to. I, I've got to take you back, like you said, when I was 23. So I, my life prior to that was pretty normal. I grew up, I have a sister, I grew up with both my parents, went on to college. I studied biology in school and I was out doing something in the U.S. we have that's called Teach for America, where you spend a couple of years teaching in a low income area. And I was teaching math for sixth grade. So for us, it's like 10, 11 year olds. And I was just finishing my second year of that. And I was home visiting some family for the holiday for the season uh, in the summer. And I was going to meet my parents like early in the morning to go to a wedding. It was about seven o'clock and I was leaving a city and someone had been drinking the night before and fell asleep while driving and came across and hit my car head on. Uh, I did not realize it that morning, but my entire life changed. And I walked away from the accident. I actually looked how I look right now. I looked okay. I had burns like from the airbag, but I kept saying like when the paramedics came onto the scene, I said, you know, I feel really out of it. And they said, oh, you're just in shock. And then my parents arrived and they said, Danielle, you don't seem normal. I said, no, I don't feel normal. And they took me to an urgent care and I was told the same thing. Oh, she's just in shock. Well, I had never been in an accident before, right? I had, you know, no context. <laughs> what does shock feel like? And um, I just kind of went on like, okay, well, hopefully it wears off. Well, Susan, in like the, the weeks that followed, uh, it became very clear that it wasn't wearing off. And I was developing this incredible sensitivity. Like I could not handle any sort of input, light, like natural light, even. It felt like someone was trying to flashlight in my eye. Um, I couldn't handle noise. I heard everything at the same level. It was like I couldn't siphon out and say, oh, this is important. Let me pay attention to that. Like it just, it all came in and my processing speed was really slow. So falling conversations was hard. I couldn't concentrate for extended periods. I would get completely overwhelmed and I was having uh, really severe migraines. And 
I was basically finally able to get in with a neurologist who told me that I had uh, suffered a traumatic brain injury. And he said, with it, I was fortunate in that it was a mild TBI, a mild traumatic brain injury, which I remember laughing and thinking like, that sounds like an oxymoron <laughs> because there's certainly nothing mild about what I'm experiencing. Uh, but they told me that most of the time with brain injury, there's a, you know, there's a brain bleed, people end up in a coma, you got to relearn to talk, to walk, all those things. I fortunately didn't have a moderate or severe case. They said, we try to get people to where you are. And I said, well, I can't function where I am. And they said, well, hopefully it kind of just heals itself. And that's what I was told. And I've been an athlete my whole life, you know, so I've had injury before and you just, you kind of push through it knowing like, all right, this is going to go. Let's just kind of keep keep on. So I attempted to go back to work and it was clear very quickly, you know, that I couldn't handle that. And my, um, my principal at the time of the school, he said, you know, Gina, I don't want to lose you. Why don't you go on a medical leave? So I tried medical leave six weeks, came back still nothing because doctors hadn't been able to say, well, do this or do that. They basically said, sit tight. Like there's nothing that can be done. And I'm very fortunate my mom, she owned a yoga studio when I was growing up and she really got to know the network of alternative practitioners in our area. And so we tapped into that network and they started to give ideas, you know, hyperbaric oxygen treatments, neurobiofeedback, um, supplementation, you know, chiropractic work, all sorts of things. And I tried these things, but still, honestly, nothing was working. And I ended up losing my job, which meant I lost my income which meant I lost my independence. And at the age of 23, I had to move back in with my family. And I'll tell you what, that was, it was very difficult because up until that point in my life, I thought Danielle was the girl that, you know, performed well at school, that did well at her job, that was a snowboarder. Like I was so identified with the things that I did in life that when all of that went away, I fell into a deep depression because I didn't know who I was. Like, if I'm not all those things, like, who am I? And if I can't do those things in the future, you know, I was being told, if you ever hit your head again, you're going to get worse. Like, you can never snowboard again. And that had been a big part of my life. Um, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to work again because I couldn't concentrate. Like, I couldn't handle anything. And so I'd get very anxious thinking about my future. And I just felt incredibly empty. Uh, it was a very confusing time. But I think, interestingly... When we're put to the test, when we have challenges in life, that's this opportunity where you can go within and go deeper. And you ask questions that if life were easy and flowing, you wouldn't have to ask. You wouldn't search for deeper meaning. But I was literally alone in bed, like 18 hours a day. Like I was tired all the time and I couldn't really go out and do much. And so I was with myself and my thoughts a lot. And it was uh, very difficult for me to navigate because I didn't have a lot of the tools that I have now that I've learned through my journey. And so it really felt like I was just like dropped in the middle of the woods by myself. And I like had to figure out how to survive. I mean, that's honestly how I felt. And it was interesting because it took an entire year before something kicked in and I felt my intuition for the first time. And it was when I went to my neurologist for my like one year checkup and <laughs> I will never forget. He said to me, Danielle, uh, with your type of injury, your body's done all the healing that it's going to do. And he said, this is just your new normal and you need to start shaping your life around your symptoms and you need to move on. And I remember thinking to myself, like, you're fired. Like it was such a clear, like, like, don't accept that. <laughs> and it's the first time I'd ever felt my intuition so strongly in front of me saying, no, like that's not going to be a belief that you bring into, into this world. Like it's no, stop it right there. And uh, I'm, I feel so grateful that that happened. And it really though, it like, it, it flipped a switch inside of me. And interestingly, because he said that to me, it caused me to go, okay, well, what if, like, what if my physical symptoms are never going to go away? Is it possible to still find happiness and find joy and to live a life that feels fulfilling? And it was like this, this game I made for myself. And I thought, all right, you've got the external world, right? The math teacher in me, <laughs> plus your internal response to it. That equals your reality. 
And so I thought, okay, well, my internal response so far to the car accident and to the brain injury has been one where I have felt like a victim. I've been saying things like, I didn't deserve this. This shouldn't have happened to me. This isn't fair. Why me? And people were validating that. Yeah, this isn't fair, Danielle. That shouldn't have happened to you. You of all people, right? I, th those are the things I was hearing from external. And when you're in that victim mentality, I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was giving my power away to the external world. I was saying, well, this has happened and I can't control it. And therefore there's nothing I can do. I'm stuck. And I don't know what you're going through, those of you listening, but I imagine the victim mentality pops in. It's like crazy how quickly it pops in. And we feel like, well, I have no control. Something external happened. And I want to tell you, you do have control. Because here's what I realized. I could shift my internal response to what was going on. I couldn't change the fact that it happened. I couldn't change the external you know, circumstances. But I could decide how I was responding to them. And so I said, okay. <laughs> you know, what is this challenge making possible? All right. Let me think about all the things I can't do is where I've been thinking for the last year. Let me think about the things I can do. And I just started to say, all right, well, I can go for a walk. You know, I can put a hat on sunglasses. Like I can handle the light. I can go for a walk. And then I thought, well, I could walk a dog. And then the local like um, humane society, they need dog walkers. So I started to go on a day that I felt well and I go walk the dog and dogs bring such a joy to my life. It was like, huh, that's a beautiful thing and it's bringing me joy and this feels much better. And then I thought, well, I can sit in a dark room and talk to my grandparents. They don't mind sitting in a dark room chatting. And so I started to spend a lot of time with my grandparents and I was having the most amazing conversations, you know, that as a child, I didn't really appreciate my grandparents for their wisdom. You know, they were just like, they were wonderful people, <laughs> but I never asked them questions about their past. You know, as kids, and you're too kind of self-centered. And I started to find out about my family history and how, you know, my family come over from Italy and, and, and Greece and all these things. And so I also started to say, all right, I cannot, like when my thoughts wander to the past, I get severely depressed. And when my thoughts wander to the future, I get severely anxious. Like I would have panic attacks where my whole body would go numb. I'd soak an entire shirt from crying. I mean, it was not good. And I said to myself, all right, stop that. <laughs> you know, you got to master this mind. Think about the present. Like, just think about right, not an hour from now, not the past hour, like right now. And I literally just forced myself into the present moment. And I forced myself into saying, what can I be grateful for right now? Like, what could bring me joy right now? And it was amazing because my whole life, I had been just constantly kind of going to the next thing. I was over an overachiever. <laughs> you know, I graduated top of my class in high school, top of my class in college, you know, did all the sports, did them well, uh, a lot of ribbons, a lot of trophies. And so, I, but it was always like about the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I missed the present moment. And it was not until my accident, like that is the biggest gift from my accident was forcing me into the present. And when I was forced into the present, it was so fascinating to watch my thoughts and to witness my thoughts and to realize the craziness that was going on in my brain and in my mind, which is what I started to write about in my ebook, uh, Susan. That's, that's really what I, what I get into next is what I go through in my ebook about the steps I took to master my mind. Um, and before I, I dive into that, I don't know if you've got any questions or anything you want me to stop and pause and go into more uh, with, with where we are so far. <laughs> oh, you know, I love it. I'm fascinated too. I'm, I'm just really enjoying listening to you. So it, it's fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and such a, a, a lovely way that you've explained it and how you go through it too, because you do, anxiety is fear of the future and depression is fear of the, the past. So um, you, I totally get that when, when you're in a situation where you don't want to look forward and you don't want to look back. Where where do you look? You you only have one choice. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> Maybe you're right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so I love that. But yes, um, now I put down on the ticker tape before we go a little bit further. Um, I had on before. I'll pop it on again. 
if you do want to connect with Daniel, uh, Daniel, with Danielle, sorry, um, it is brainbodyself.com. That's your website, and you will get the ebook on the brainbodyself.com website. So tell us a little bit more about this ebook. Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, as so I'll I'll tell you how this kind of developed. So as I was sitting there, staying super focused on the present, I started to notice, and of course it was my parents first, because I was living at home, and I would like see these dynamics where they would be running on these patterns. Like I could see the patterns that they had and they like were totally oblivious to this fact. And I could see them both come into a situation and I could almost see like before it happened, uh, an argument or a disagreement or like a complete misunderstanding. And I'm like, well, of course, cause I was so present. I was witnessing what was coming into the conversation the entire day my mom had just had and my da dad had just had. And now, you know, because just total miscommunication. And, um, you know, feelings get hurt, whatever. And then I was watching and I was like, half of my friends too. And then I was watching the news and I'm like, man, there are such a pattern, like loop. Like I can predict the news right before it's going to happen of all the fear and doom and gloom and all this stuff. And then I realized, Danielle, you're not immune to this. Uh, you have a bunch of these patterns too. And that's when I stopped. I wasn't judging people, but it was like, it was really fascinating to me. I've always been very curious. And so I thought, all right, well, let's just observe my own because they're the only ones that I can really do anything with. And so I started to witness how a situation might occur and I'd get triggered. Like I would have an emotional reaction to what just happened. And it could have been a person that said something. It could have been, you know, a situation that unfolded. And I would, I would typically, I'd get angry at the person or situation because I'm like, well, you made me feel that way. And then I realized, no, 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 that feeling was inside of me. Why did I react that way? That's a better question because that just is what it is. I had a reaction to it. And the same person can watch the same situation and have a multitude of reactions, right? Why? Because inside of us, there is something making us react that way. And so I talk about in the book, this power of observation, observing the thoughts, and then realizing that the thoughts that you're having are, it's kind of like you've got sunglasses on. Like there's this lens that you're looking through life where you're not actually seeing the present moment for what it is. You're seeing it through this lens, usually of your past, past experiences, past situations. This happens a lot in relationships, right? Something happened in a previous relationship. Now we kind of bring that into this relationship, a distrust because you think someone's going to cheat on you, whatever it is. You know, a lot of people have, or I can talk about mine. I'll, I'll speak to me. You know, I had a lens of not feeling good enough, not feeling worthy not feeling like my voice was heard, this feeling of like, well, what about me? Like, how did you forget about me? And so I would bring that into situations that the person really didn't forget about me. It had nothing to do with me, but I would get all offended. Like, well, why, you know, how come they didn't ask me? And it was fascinating because I realized, oh my gosh, like life is this beautiful game that's trying constantly to tap on our shoulder and say, hey, take the sunglasses off. Hey, that, that like lens of you're not feeling good enough, like that's BS from your past, like remove it. You're, you are more than good enough. You have so much to offer that those lenses are limiting you. And every person, right? The trigger is the teacher. Every person, every situation is meant to teach you. It's that tap on the shoulder. Like, yeah, you see that you're responding that way. That's not healthy. <laughs> you don't need to be responding that way. Take off the sunglasses. You are loved. You are enough, right? Whatever, whatever that is that's rooted in us, and as I started to do that, and guys, this is like deep inner work, okay? It sounds simple if you're following me, <laughs> but it's uh, not easy because you have to look at yourself in the mirror and you got to, you take responsibility squarely. Like it all starts and ends here with you. And a lot of people aren't ready for that. Like I said, when we're in these victim mentalities, it's like, well, you know, how, how can I take responsibility? I'm not saying that you're condoning something that's happened. Like, I don't condone that man driving drunk. I don't think it was okay that he did what he did. But the reality is it happened. And so I needed to accept that it had happened. And then I was in a space of power to say, all right, how do I want to react to this? You know, and as you're witnessing your thoughts, you realize that a lot of times you're having these responses that are just automatic. And they're really unhealthy and they're making you miserable, right? When you get frustrated, you're really not helping the situation. You're just making yourself miserable in the situation. So get rid of that. 
and decide how it is you want to interact and react and realize you have the control. That's why I called the book Mind Control because it's all in your head and you get to pick the, the conversation that your head is having. And you get to start to insert you know, new ideas, new belief systems, new ways of being. And when you do that, your world will change. So this is what happened to me. I started to shift and change my inner world, right? All the ways I was telling you, I started to kind of have this mantra of I'm going to be open. I'm going to be patient, right? Open to what might be coming into my life, patient as it all unfolds. And no kidding, like we got a phone call from an acupuncturist that knew my mom. And she said, uh, I've come across a health technology. It's a self signaling supplement that helps the body to signal out where there's damage so the body can come repair it. And she said, you know, you have a lot of this when you're young, which Danielle's young, so she has a lot, but she's had a lot of damage. It's almost like there's just like one bar of service, like the body's not hearing the call. And she said, I believe this would pass the blood brain barrier. It's helped some of my clients with digestive issues. It's helped with hormone issues. It's helped with skin issues, lung issues. She said, it doesn't matter because it just helps the cells. And so whatever, you know, tissue that cell is a part of is going to be helped. So we get this call and I'll be honest, I, I thought it sounded too good to be true. <laughs> so, you know, that little voice came in, the not helpful one and was like, there's no way this could be. Like the scientist in me, I'm a biologist, that's what I got my degree in, was like, show me the science, like, give me proof. And for six months, I kind of had this attitude and air about it. But my mom trusts her intuition. I hadn't learned to do that yet. My mom was like, Danielle, I intuitively know this is the answer. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and she's like, no, I know that it is. And uh, it's the missing link. And I'm like, I'm not drinking it. And so she started drinking it. And it was this stuff, it's called a Sea of Redox. It's actually that blue bottle that's behind me. And my mom starts drinking this. She had bone on bone in her hands and literally she could not make a fist. She could get to like right here. Drinking that stuff for six weeks, she got full range of motion back in her hands. And I watched it happen. And I was still like, it's gotta be a placebo. <laughs> you know, I was still so in my mind. And my dad though, he thought, well, let me try it. Let's see what it does for me. So my dad starts using this. And my dad had a knee injury from 30 years prior. He starts drinking this stuff. 10 days into drinking it, he's not wearing his brace on his knee. He works out every day. And he was like, Danny, like, I feel like I'm 30 years old again. I got so much energy. My knee's not hurting. Like, I'm repairing super fast after I work out. Like, this stuff's amazing. So my dad's more analytical. He went to look at the research and he came back and he said, it's too new. You didn't learn about it in school. That's why you don't know about it. It's a new science. And he said, this is the only company right now that has redox signaling molecules stable, so you can take them. And he said, you're gonna drink it. Give it six months, let's see what it does. And uh, that's, that's how I started. So I have been on a journey myself with learning to master the mind, let go of how we expect things to be, right? I was expecting one day to just wake up healthy. I wasn't expecting the answer to come in a blue bottle. You know, so just another lesson to me of like, don't have an expectation, you gotta be open to how things are gonna unfold. Uh, so I start drinking this stuff and three months in, it wasn't immediate for me, but three months in, the pounding that had been relentless in my head for two years stopped. I started to be able to concentrate again. I had energy again. It was amazing. My cognitive therapist said she'd never seen anything like it in her 30 years of dealing with brain injury. She said, Danielle, with your type of injury, people don't heal this rapidly so far out from the initial trauma, just okay. it doesn't happen. And she's like, what the hell is that stuff you started drinking? You know, and that that opened up a, a ton. Talk about inflection points in your life. She was this catalyst for me to learn what it was. And when I learned what it was, this is again, when my intuition spoke to me, I got goosebumps head to toe as I was listening to the founder talk about this technology, how it came into being, how they were bringing it out to the world, the impact it was making about serving other people by sharing this. And I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Like it was such a clear intuitive hit. And, you know, prior in my life, I just, I did what society said I should do what like, you know, get the good grades, get a good job, like all that stuff. And now I'm like a different human being, you know, now I'm like hearing this voice inside of me saying, no, you're not going to go to graduate school. No, you're not going back to a nine to five job. 
and now you're meant to share about this technology. That's why you went through what you went through. You were meant to show other people how they can get their health back. You're meant to share this technology. And I'm sitting there going like, well, I, I'm a scientist. Like, I don't know how to sell anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what am I supposed to do with that? And uh, not to mention, like, it's through word of mouth. And I was like, network marketing is like the sleaziest thing someone could be a part of. I want nothing to do with it. And again, intuition's like, no, this is it. And this company is different. And they have a soul. And this is what you're meant to do. And so I'm like having this inner battle, which was super interesting. I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but I'm very headstrong. Uh, so I had to just keep quieting my mind and going into my heart space and asking, what am I supposed to do next? What am I supposed to do next? And it was like, just Google, Google networking. So I Googled networking. I had just moved. Like when I got healthy, I was able to move out of my parents' house. I moved in with a guy I was dating down in Florida. I knew him. That was it. Didn't know anybody else. And I am shy. I was. Uh, I really, like, if I was in a group, I didn't say anything. You know, I, I'm very much introverted. And it was like, no, you need to go out into the community. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so I Google networking. I see this business networking international, BNI, go to this meeting. And I literally like, just like this, like, I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. The words coming out of my mouth make no sense. I feel like I'm just like a complete idiot. And I kid you not, it's amazing how the universe just, it supports you. So I took a step and I took action. And no joke, the man that was checking people into that meeting, this is the only time this has ever happened when I have been out networking. He says to me, oh, I know Asiya. And I was like, you do? And he goes, yeah, it helped me with my running. I was taking it for years. And he said, I'd love to help you. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, literally, he just kept saying, how can I help you? And I was like, I have no idea how you, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, he said, why don't you come? My wife and I, we do a training every Saturday morning. Let's pause the space. You'll be all week. We train our team on how to share and how to network and do all this stuff. They work with Primerica. And I was like, okay. I didn't, I think he probably didn't think I was going to show up, but I showed up. And then I kept showing up. I showed up every week for two years and he and his wife changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. And it's like, when you listen to your intuition and don't worry about how something happens, when it's going to happen, like you just do, it's amazing. And so my business, he was a strategic person. My business started to take off. He started to introduce me to people, a massage therapist he introduced me to. Well, initially she was very resistant to me, but months later she said, I'm at my wit's end. My husband's had a stroke and a brain injury and um, I know this helped you, can this help him? And we watched his health get restored after 90 days. He started to be able to speak again. He had the energy to go to the gym again. He's been on the product now for up seven years. Um, and just one thing after another, that massage therapist then wanted to share with people. Like doors just like naturally started opening and my business became my spiritual practice where I learned these principles of, you know, like the law of polarity, how things swing equal and opposite. And so I'd know when things felt like they weren't going anywhere, it was because we were getting ready for stuff to go very quickly. And when things were going quickly, I was like, get ready because there's going to be a lull. <laughs> you know, it's like there's just this swing, this natural flow. It's there's duality in this world and you go from dark to light and you just, that's, that's the flow of it. And so I started to learn these things in my business and I started to see how my inner world and my inner dialogue was impacting my ability to show up as an entrepreneur. You know, when my self image was small and tiny, I produced small and tiny. When I decided to get expansive internally and hold the energy of a leader, you know, all of a sudden I had a team of people I was leading and it's just continued. Like we're now eight years into this and I have an international organization. I've helped people globally, thousands. And I look back and I'm like, well, how did I get here? <laughs> you know? But it's because I trusted my intuition. Like I will tell you, the world was telling me not to do this. My sister was like, you're crazy you need to get a job. Like you were, you're working with a BS thing. Like this isn't even real. You know, you're, you're making this all up. Like it was not pleasant. I had very, very, very good friends saying to me, 
Danielle, it's time to get serious. Like you've gotten better from your injury. You need to reintegrate into the world. Like you need to go on to graduate school. And I was like, no, no. And then other people saying to me, well, that type of job's not safe. That company could go under. And I was like, yeah, but your job's not safe. If you lose your health, you, you can't earn money anymore. That's what happened to me. You know, I'll at least still earn money if I lose my health again, because people are still going to buy this because they're benefiting from it. It has nothing to do with me. It was such an interesting lesson over this last, it's now been a decade. Going from this version of Danielle to who I am now. I mean, it was like, you know how a caterpillar has to like disintegrate before it can come out as a butterfly? Like that's the process I've been in and it's taken a decade. And it was like when I was in that cocoon that I learned about my inner world. Like I had to go through this intense trauma, everything that I thought I was fall apart for me to really fall together. And for me to come out on the other side as a completely different person, right? A caterpillar to a butterfly, like, whoa. And that's why I talk about, you see here, post-traumatic growth. This is something a lot of trauma survivors experience. And I don't know why, for the life of me, I can't figure out why we don't shine more light on this. Because as a society, we focus a lot on post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Oh, these veterans, they went through an intense situation. They're broken. You know, this natural disaster happened, like, you know, the hurricane took all of your belongings. That just happened not far from where I live. Um, you know, you you lost a loved one. I'm not saying these things aren't hard. I'm not saying they don't shift and change you, you know, like an injury like I went through. It changed me to my core. But it's the growth that happens on the other side. Like the situation is happening because you are ready. Like you're chosen. Your soul is like, we put in for the upgrade. <laughs> You know, like we're ready to learn some lessons. Here's the test. You're taking the test. Like the challenge you're going through right now is the test. And it's to teach you that everything you need is inside of you. You've got all the potential sitting in there and you're connected to the infinite. You need something, just ask. You want something, hold the space of gratitude for receiving it and it will come. Like that's the power you learn, but you can't just get there. Like you you got to go through the test and it can be difficult, you know, and everybody's difficulties are different. Like there's no comparing. Oh, that's harder than that. No, like some people, it's just their child going off to college. You're now an, you know, you've got an empty nest. Your whole life and identity has been being a mother and you've probably done it incredibly well. So now what? And who am I if I'm not mom? That's a trauma in and of itself, too. And growth can happen because now you get to go internal. You get to find out more about you and yourself. And you can you can make this beautiful shift into who you are now. It doesn't mean you're not so going to be a good mom, but motherhood looks different now. So there's there's a lot that can unfold. And I I believe in a concept called the Pygmalion effect. And the Pygmalion effect is so cool. Maybe I love it because they did it with teachers. So they basically took a, a classroom and these people came in and gave a test to the kids. And then they came back to the teacher and they said, the test reveals to us which students in your classroom are gonna have massive growth this year. They're underperforming right now, but they're actually super talented. And they're, I think they called them spurters. They're gonna spurt this year. And they give the list of names to the teacher. At the end of the year, they came back and asked how the kids were performing. Every single one on the spurter list had spurted, had had a ton of growth, did incredibly well. And the other kids, didn't, you didn't see that. Well, it turned out the test they took was complete BS. There was nothing to it. They made up who the spurters were going to be. And then the teacher, thinking that this child had this special gift, right? They nurtured it. They spoke to it. They, they pulled the child up to that level. And so the child did. It's called the Pygmalion effect. People will rise to the level that you expect them to. And they, they got kind of in trouble because the parents of the kids that weren't the Spurgers got very upset <laughs> when they found out all of this. But uh, so I don't think they've been able to repeat that study. But super interesting concept, because if you look at trauma, because I had all these people around me saying, oh, I'm so sorry, you were a victim and how bad for you. And like, you didn't deserve that. And so it was, I kept me in this small space. If I had people saying to me, something beautiful is going to come out of this, Danielle, like you are going to learn things about yourself that you've never known. 
it's going to, it would have pulled me in a different way. The only person that I had say something like that was a, a therapist I'd started going to. And I had told him I was having a really hard time because all of my friends were getting graduate degrees. I, no joke. I had friends going to Yale and Harvard to get MBAs. I had a couple of friends in school to become doctors and the others were getting PhDs. I had, like I told you, like high performer. So my peers were too. <laughs> and I said to my therapist, like, I get on the internet and I get on social media and I see what my friends are doing. And it literally gives me such a sinking feeling. And I feel like such a failure and like, I'm never going to be able to do anything in my life. And my therapist said to me, Danielle, they're getting a, a piece of paper. And he said, you are getting schooled in life right now. He said, your emotional growth is going to be phenomenal. The amount of emotional intelligence you're going to have when you get through this, he said, I'm not going to have a piece of paper for you, but you're going to be a better mom. You're going to be a more compassionate person. You're going to be able to interact with people on a different level, things that your friends will never, ever have because of what you've had to go through. And that right, was him telling me about this growth that was going to happen. And I held to that. I held to that like it was like my safety line, you know, because I felt like I was in a pit, like there was no way out of it. And I held on to that, like, okay, that's, that's the street. That's where we're going. And he was right. And I know that that served me in my business and in my ability to, you know, connect with people. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's been an incredible, incredible journey, <laughs> Susan. And I, I hope that, um, you know, it, it sheds some light on, on things for people with what they're going through in their life. Yeah. I, I, I really like the idea of when you, when you are sort of in that victim mode that everything everyone says uh, sort of reiterates it, you know, when, when they, uh, you know, poor you, poor you, uh, they will reiterate that sort of um, belief. But if you can change that understanding and then look at the positives, yes, it's going to make your trajectory a little bit different. Yeah. And you will start to look at things a little bit differently. So, yeah, that was really cool. Thank you so much for sharing all that. That was amazing. Yeah, you're welcome. I uh, It's it's like funny, to, I'm just be honest, it's funny to be on here talking to myself and not seeing you. And I was like, oh, I hope this is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, we, we, we're sort of running out of time. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish? Um, I'll just say this, you know, I, I'm super active on social media. And so if you feel like reminders of this would be helpful to you, uh, connect with me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, like wherever, pick your platform. Uh, I am constantly putting out things just to, to shine light on what life might be trying to teach you, reminding you of duality. You know, we live in a world of duality. What I mean by that is there's day and night. There's feminine and masculine. Right? You think about the sun and the moon. We need both. And you think about the yin yang. I think what's so beautiful about that, it's like the dark and light chasing each other. One, you know, leads into the other, which then leads into the other. And it's a cycle. Like that's what it is. But there's also a seed of darkness in the light. And there's a seed of light in the dark. And it's to remind us, you know, to make us aware that Look, if we didn't have the darkness, we wouldn't appreciate the light as much. And when we're in the light, we appreciate it more knowing that there is this darkness that could be here. And when you know that, you're able to just have a calm confidence knowing it's all a cycle and it's all just meant for learning. Like this is a learning journey. Your soul is on a learning journey and your intuition is your guide. And I don't know why we don't teach kids this. Like this is something that everyone should be knowing from a young age on that your guidance is internal. You know, we spend our whole lives like looking for the answer external, like whole life. People go on pilgrimages, like they do everything. They keep looking out and it's like, you know, what a joke because all they had to do was turn around <laughs> and the answer was inside the whole time. I mean, it's like it's a rough joke. You know, it's not really funny. It's like, it's a hard lesson to learn that, Oh my God, all I had to do was look within me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> And that's the truth of the matter. You know, all the answers are within you. You just got to trust it. It might sound bizarre. Like for me, going out and sharing about a, a cell signaling technology, like never in my life did I think I'd be doing what I was, what I'm doing right now. But my intuition kept telling me, take a step, take a step, take a step, take a step. And now I get it, you know, 
uh, and it wasn't about me. It was about the people that I was meant to help and lead and serve. And I grew through that process too. So that's, uh, that's the last of what I'll share. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so that's it. We run out of time. I will say, uh, make sure you share, like, subscribe to the podcast and jump onto the website and have a look at Danielle's uh, website. It is, oh gosh, what was it? Hang on, I've got it on the other banner. Again, it is brainbodyself.com. So look at brainbodyself.com. But that is us for this week. Um, I'm going to say bye for now and I'll catch up with you next week. Okay, bye for now. Whoops, it stopped going.